The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, a senior China Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. Kobus, you are still awake after a marathon week of travel. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. I'm barely awake. <laughs> <laughs> Just for those of you who have no idea what he's been doing. Uh, so last week was Ivory Coast. And then a few days later, it was off to Korea. And now he's back to Johannesburg. And before that, you were in Argentina. Oh, I'm just exhausted even thinking about it. Uh, my my so, time uh, zones I, are so scrambled by now. <laughs> you must be. Oh, my gosh. Well, it's exciting that, you know, there are all these kind of international conferences and think tank meetings that you're going to, uh, that there is at least a seat at the table for someone who thinks about China-Africa relations. So I, I think that's kind of progress in some ways. And, uh, you know, so very, very exciting. But we are glad that you're here with us today. So we're going to be talking about trade today, and it's something that has been on my mind for, for quite some time, but particularly this week, because I saw a couple of articles that caught my attention. Number one, if you've been following the news between the United States and China, how can you miss it? Um, there is a trade dispute, a trade war, a trade kerfuffle. I don't know what you call it, but it's not good. Tariffs are flowing back and forth. Basically, the Chinese have tariffed everything that they sell to that, that comes in from the United States. The United States has tariffed hundreds of billions of dollars and still has another tranche of about $200 billion at the time of this recording that uh, can be tariffed. Uh, it's not good. It's not pretty. There's no doubt. And what if you look at some of the analysis of it, we're looking at a realignment of the global trading system. And people are talking about a decoupling of the United States and Chinese economies. And we're starting to see some evidence of this in lots of interesting ways. And it touches Africa. So today on CNBC, I noticed uh, a headline, China's dramatically cutting U.S. oil imports. Now, beginning in September or August, China suddenly stopped all of its oil imports from the United States. And a lot of people think that that was a politically motivated decision for them to do. It was not because they are sourcing from other places, but this is one way that they can register their frustration with the United States. And what was interesting about it is the fact that they're now turning to Angola and Nigeria more for West African crude imports. And so this brought me to this idea that maybe the old saying that when the elephants fight, it's the grass that suffers may not always be true here if Africa can find ways to position itself as a beneficiary of the China-US trade scuffle. So Kobus, I've been thinking a lot about this, but at the end of the day, that may be too optimistic because small commodity exporting countries tend to suffer much more in these types of disputes. But it, are you seeing what I'm seeing that there may be some potential for African countries to benefit from the ongoing dispute between the United States and China? I mean, it's uh, in the first place, I have to, of course, say that, you know, again, the, the disclaimer that I'm not an economist and I'm not a trade expert. Um, but it, it does seem to me that the the we we seeing you know to a certain extent a, a dismantling or a weakening of the of the the trade system that that we've seen up to now including a significant weakening of the world trade organization um and so you know to to a large extent the trade system that we've seen up to now has been has been difficult i think for for small producers among others because they were frequently crowded out of the market by by um by domestic subsidies in big markets um you know so the the, the i don't think that there's necessarily um you know much much chance that that that, that system as a whole is going to change but it, it seems that there might be some gaps opening um what we're also seeing is a kind of a breakdown in multilateralism where you know the the the, the there is talk that that the trump administration in in picking fights with a lot of its traditional trade partners um are also now pushing them into you know into 
renegotiating some of the multilateral trade deals that they had in favor of new bilateral trade deals. Um, and so, so we're seeing what, what used to be a relatively um, coherent kind of facade is suddenly developing lots of gaps and lots of different structures. Um, so in between, the, you know, with those, those gaps might well offer some opportunities for, for small producers. But it, I think it depends very much on the particular product and the particular moment. Okay, well, let's actually get a firsthand perspective on this. And this is why I wanted to bring back uh, Walter Rigu, those of you who are longtime listeners of the show will remember a discussion we had with Walter a couple of years ago. Walter is the managing director of China Africa Merchant Advisors Limited, otherwise known as CAMEL, which is an independent trade and investment consulting firm. He's based uh, in between Beijing, Lusaka, and Nairobi. Uh, I would love to see your frequent flyer balance. Um, you probably fly business everywhere just from all the miles that you put on. Um, <laughs> Camel has, uh, as again, operations in all three countries. They do two-way trade. From China, they're exporting equipment, steel, and construction materials along with chemicals. And then from Africa back into China, it's mostly commodities and raw materials. So that gives you a little sense. This is a guy who literally puts stuff into shipping containers and gets it over to Africa or from Africa to China. So we thought no better person to have to talk about trade and the conditions that we are in today and the mood we are. Walter, welcome back to the program. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Yeah, we appreciate you taking the time to join us from Nairobi. Well, let's get your perspective. What are you and your clients seeing right now, given all of the tumultuous rhetoric that we're seeing and this in the very unstable situation, at least from the outside looking in, What's the view from the actual trader's point of view? Yes, I think the view is complicated. There is a lot of noise. There is a lot of noise uh, throughout the world. There is a lot of noise when you're discussing trade. There is an ongoing U.S.-China trade war, and that uh, is causing a lot of complications globally. But to be honest, in terms of the micro level, um, trade is continuing. Um, people, you know, people in different places of the world Nobody has everything, so the trade must continue. And one thing that uh, is directly impacting us, uh, that is happening between the, the, the international global trade, is the depreciation of the renminbi. The depreciation of the renminbi in, in recent months uh, has been quite sharp, um, from uh, around 6.5. It was actually even a low of 6.3, and now it's uh, topping 6.9. So this is actually a benefit when it comes to exporting from China because uh, we do a, a lot of exports. At the same time, we do export to China and the increasing, uh, um, you know, the, the, the renminbi's depreciation is actually also causing some problems. Just for those of our listeners who are not expert in currency finances, explain to us how it benefits China when the renminbi depreciates. I think the, the easiest way to think about it is that um, the exporters are benefiting the most because they are working with the renminbi, but the people who are paying them are paying in USD. So as the renminbi depreciates, they're getting actually more and more. So it benefits, it benefits the exporters. However, for the importers, it's actually worse because they are, export, they are importing uh, products and having to send USD overseas. Walter, the, the the discussion in the trade war of the of the different tariffs and the different phases of tariffs have been there's been a lot of discussion of that flying around. Have you seen any tariffs actually being implemented on the ground as as yet? Yes, in terms of U.S. China trade, uh, the tariffs are being implemented on the ground, especially in products such as uh, you know my, mineral concentrates and even products such as uh, solar solar products, etc. So what this has done, for instance, is that China used to import a lot of concentrates from the United States, but because now the tariffs are higher, they are looking for other places that can supply this product. This also applies to various agricultural goods. And of course, the most famous is the, is the soybean. Uh, China is the world's largest consumer of soybean. The United States has been the largest supplier. So with the new tariffs, uh, China is looking globally uh, for anybody who can supply um, soybeans, for instance. Well, let's talk, let's talk about soybeans for a second here. And I, I mentioned this on a previous show where I put out this, this thinking that 
if I was a venture capital investor, I would be scouring the world, particularly in places like Africa, looking for people who want to plant soybeans. Because if I was the Chinese, I would tell the Americans, you know what? I am never going to be dependent on you for soy ever again. I've learned my lesson. And that's a $14 billion business that the United States is jeopardizing right now. So the question is, can Africa start to fill some of this void? We know that Brazil now is planting vast acres of soy in order to satisfy the, the new Chinese demand. Uh, soy grows well in places like Nigeria. The problem in Nigeria is security because a lot of the fields for, that where soy could grow are in places that are controlled by Boko Haram and others. So are there opportunities like soy for African uh, uh, commodity exporters to fill the gap of what the, the Americans used to produce so that the African agricultural sector can benefit? Listen, uh, in theory, of course, Africa and other places can offer an alternative, but in reality, it's not so easy. Uh, America, the supply chains have been established for a very long time. The amount of uh, soybean that China imports is massive. And uh, I'll give you an example that happened in Russia. Russia is giving free land to Chinese investors to plant soybeans so that they can export uh, back to China. But the demand, the demand in China is so large that Presently, even with the tariffs, they cannot completely abandon the United States. However, having said this, um, it is a big opportunity, but it's better to start from bottom up in terms of the thinking of exporting to China. What I mean about this is that China has one of the world's uh, most stringent requirements when it comes to imports, especially of consumption, uh, consumption products. So in order for a country and in order for a firm to be allowed to export product that will be consumed, there is a rigorous process. So from the, from the macro perspective, yes, other countries, this is a big opportunity, but one needs to start from the details to understand uh, how difficult it is to uh, win China of this uh, American dependence on soybean. Yeah, we've definitely seen that issue around agricultural products. We've seen this in South Africa, um, you know, that the, each product that gets admitted to the Chinese market is a massive, is a ma massive victory, and it, it takes for sometimes takes years to get through all of the all of the different tests. At the same time. Um, the you, you know the kind of the, the focus on on agro processing in African development is is really gaining strength. Um, you know, for example, the G20 is focusing on it a lot. There's there's a there's a there's a lot of kind of high level focus on trying to to kickstart industrial agriculture in Africa. Um, but that is very much a kind of a medium to long term prospect. You know, kind of there's a, there's a lot of land tenure issues and other kinds of issues that need to be worked out before that can, the, those systems can really get going. Then I think there's a lot of questions in Africa about how to how to benefit, you know, African populations and not disrupt rural rural communities in the process. Um, Walter, moving to mining um, now that now that the the mineral concentrates that you mentioned now, now that China is is finding more and more trouble for, um, buying some of those products in the U.S. Is there realistic ways for them to switch to Africa to get some of those mineral concentrates? Yes, of course. But uh, again, this is the issue of whether the product will meet the required uh, quality. Um, in, in the more advanced countries that have the, you know, they have the machinery and they have the expertise to upgrade the concentrates, then, of course, um, the Chinese companies have no other options because now if the price is lower from wherever it is, whether it's Africa or any other country in the world, they will buy it. So what what this trade war is creating is actually it's it's completely changing the global supply chain because whereas some companies were only focused on dealing with with uh, with the West whether it's for exports or imports now they're being forced to look elsewhere and this is an opportunity not only for Africa but for anyone else who is not within that tariff zone. You know, you keep talking about the stringent import requirements that the Chinese put on, on African exports. And I, I'm just trying to understand what those are. I mean, as somebody who lives in China where there are quality problems with products all over the place, um, I'm, it's just hard for me to understand how the Chinese are so stringent on imports when domestically there's so much 
you know, lax enforcement of quality standards. And, you know, the Japanese, for example, have a lot of restrictions on importing agricultural products because they have very powerful domestic constituencies that want to protect that agricultural market. Same in the United States, same in Europe. As best as you can understand, why are the Chinese putting these 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 restrictions on imports or these stringent requirements, as you say, when it seems to me that they could open up their markets much more to African products as a way to offset a lot of the criticism that they're getting on the loan side by actually empowering small-scale farmers and, and, and really important constituencies in Africa and, and, and creating opportunities that way and, and making it not look like they're only taking from Africa, but they're actually providing a benefit to Africans. Yeah, for my observation over the years, it's not only uh, import restrictions that are targeted towards Africa. The restrictions apply uh, across the board. And the example I would use is probably meat. Um, one of the largest pro uh, exporters of meat to China is Australia. But the Australian market has been forced to comply with the, you know, the requirements of the Chinese domestic market. And this applies on two levels. One is on the macro, on the government level. The government must ensure all the exporters fulfill certain requirements. And then the, requ the firms themselves have to ensure that they are fulfilling that, uh, those requirements. Because the way it works in China, if one firm exports bad product to China, then China will shut off the, mi the, the, the exports of that whole country. So there needs to be monitoring on two levels. One is on the macro, on the government level, and the second is on the firm level. So these kind of requirements, when it comes to a country that maybe is not as developed as Australia, if one, if one, on the, if one of the levels has not been uh, properly calibrated, then you know, the, whole market, uh, the whole market access ends up being blocked. And the second issue that you raise, the, the way the system of exporting from China is, is, is built is not the same way that the import system is built. So the import, there is more restrictions and there is more checking and there is more controls, but for the export, uh, not so much as the, as the import. And this is a legacy from also the, the, the time when China was more closed and the economy was more central planned. So as the opening up of China happened in the late 70s until today, the exports opened up much faster than the imports. That's such an interesting point. Like I never, I never hundred percent realized that how that how those two work together. Um, you know, re, re, linking to that, and then also returning to your earlier point about the the weakening of the of the RMB. Um, how, how is Chinese how how is Chinese exports being affected by 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 the weakening of the RMB? Um, and and how are you seeing that in your in your own business? The weakening, the weakening of the RMB, like I mentioned, this is actually encouraging uh, exports. And one concrete example I can give you is the prices have actually decreased for some of our clients. So I'm able to offer some discounts because of the marginal change in the exchange rate. So the exchange rate depreciating is helping exports from China. So do you see then a, a, a wider range of products to being exported or just larger volumes of the same products? Um, there's two things. One, um, we are definitely seeing a larger amount of exports for the same products. But there are a few categories that were not, were not so competitive because small incremental changes um, in price affects the product because there's a lot of competition coming from countries such as Turkey, India, Russia, etc. And we see this a lot in the, in the chemicals, industrial chemical market. The margins are very thin and there's a lot of competition amongst uh, the, the, the supplying nations. So the depreciation allows some chemicals to become competitive. Support for this podcast comes from the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University School of Journalism in Johannesburg. The ACRP provides reporting grants, workshops, and other professional development opportunities for both African and Chinese journalists. Follow the ACRP on Twitter at Wits China Africa or visit africachinareporting.co.za for information about grants and upcoming seminars. So China-Africa trade today is somewhere around $170 billion 
uh, every year. It fluctuates between 150 and 190 on average now. But since about 2014, 2015, it's down sharply from about $220 billion when that reached a high. And it's gone steadily down. And if you look at the charts, um, there's a clear pattern that there's less trade between China and Africa, and it doesn't seem like it's rebounding anytime soon. Uh, China now trades far more with Latin America than it does, or Latin and South America, than it does with Africa. And a lot of people actually don't realize that. Chinese trade now with the Middle East uh, is going up, obviously, mostly in oil. Uh, but China's trade is much more diversified than it was 10 years ago. And I guess I'm, my question for you is, are you seeing that downward trend in your own business? Or are you seeing confidence on the part of your African and Chinese clients that they're going to still hold on to this trade uh, and not diversify to other parts of the world? I think if you look at the numbers from a macro perspective, yeah, there has been a decrease. But in order to really understand China-Africa trade, you need to understand China domestic uh, situation. So before, when China was, uh, when the Chinese economy was highly dependent on investment in fixed assets, that's when the trade was really high, because at that time um, the commodities were moving from Africa to China to fill this booming economy. But as the Chinese economy is shifting to one that is focused more on uh, domestic consumption and there is a slowing down of the real estate sector domestically in China, then the requirement for those types of goods has also been decreasing. And in, if you look at the macro perspective between China and Africa trade, one thing that people usually miss is the significance of Angola. Angola used to export a lot of petroleum to China. And with a decrease of those exports, it affects the whole figure, the whole China-Africa macro trade figure. So I would not be caught up too much on the macro figures because whereas the, the number itself has decreased, the China-Africa trade it continues to boom in, in both directions because as the Chinese middle class continues to expand, they also have different requirements than, say, you know, the larger, uh, the larger real estate, the larger trading companies that are more focused on commodities. So I would say the the future of the trade it looks it looks it looks actually quite positive because um, the two areas continue to have uh, complementarities. And yeah, just to add to that, I think you know the the expansion of the middle class in Africa is also shifting the the, the picture a little bit. So I was looking at at numbers of cell phones um, and particularly the the sales of uh, by the Chinese company Transian who makes who makes techno phones which is the, the the biggest phones the biggest seller of phones in Africa they sold a million handsets last year alone in Africa um, this you know and, and I think that that's still very much an untapped market actually I think you know there, there's a lot more to be sold where that where that came from so it's, it's very yeah and those guys control about a third of the market they can yeah. the technos are about a third of the entire market it's unbelievable yeah and the well, irony um, the irony let me just add on to that the irony of that whole situation is that if you ask the average Chinese person in the mainland about techno they've never heard of this company. So this is a this is one of the situations where you have a, a Chinese firm that has localized so much and has become you know it's a big brand in Africa, but nobody has ever heard of them on the mainland. Yeah, it's it's so interesting. Um, what I was wondering, you know, one of one of the big issues around around the trade war is is all of the is all of the allegations that China is breaking international trade norms or even breaking WTO rules. Um, and I, I was speaking with recently speaking with a with a China trade expert who, who made the point that he in his in his opinion um, China hasn't hasn't broken many WTO rules. They just uh, um, proved very 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 effective at at exploiting WTO loopholes. Um, but you know, kind of be that as it may, in, in, in your work, how, how do, do you experience this? You know, kind of some of these some of these kind of alleged abuses from China, or the, or a particular kind of overly hard nosed um, way of trading that makes it impossible for for foreign traders to do business with China. Um, I'll say this: um, in terms of trade, uh, every company, whether the African company, Chinese, Western. They're looking for profit. What I've seen in the mainland, there is an attitude of 
higher volumes, lower profit type of business. That means let's get into the market. We might make small profit, but let's try and move higher volumes. Um, the Western point of view might be different. There might be, let's get higher profit, but let's get the deal done. So there's already a difference in philosophy on how to capture, capture the market. So that we, we, we see on a constant basis. The second thing is that there's a large fragmentation in terms of the Chinese companies that are doing business with Africa or looking to do business or are already in Africa. There's a large fragmentation. And most of the companies are actually private companies. So the private companies, they're all driven by profit, right? And so this actually dispels the myth that there is a coordinated strategy coming from Beijing on how to capture the market. Because most of the companies we know and most of the firms uh, we deal with, they are looking at the specific project, they're looking at the specific business opportunity, and it's not uh, some you know, central planned strategy. That may be true for some of the larger state companies when it comes to projects such as, uh, you know, the Belt and Road. But for, I would say, 90%, over 90% of the firms, this is not the case. 90%, wow. I mean, again, that's a big... That's a that's a big myth bust there because a lot of people again assume that it was driven by state owned enterprises and government backed entities and so to hear you say that is is very interesting and that that kind of complements what Irene Yuan Sun who uh, from McKinsey she wrote a book that said a lot of the FDI coming into Africa and a lot of the job growth from Chinese companies in Africa is all done by the private sector so uh, super interesting hey I'd like to close our discussion here on you know a pulse check and this is this idea that. We're in very, very scary times right now. A lot of people are very anxious about what's coming ahead because the rules are changing in front of us. As you talked about, the uh, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty in the market. Your clients are a little bit nervous. Uh, we're all anxious about what's going to happen between the United States and China and what will, what will the impact be uh, in developing countries, particularly in places like Africa, where debt levels are on the rise. Uh, currency fluctuations are com compounding the problem. I mean, again, a, a, a cheaper Chinese currency, it helps the Chinese, but it makes it more difficult for your African clients to, to do business with the Chinese. So there's winners and losers here. When new clients come to you or some of your older clients come to you and say, Walter, tell me what I need to know. What do you tell them about the times that we're in right now? What, what's, the, what's the key thing that they need to know about the China-Africa trade right now that you want that you would tell your clients? I think the most important thing is uh, the devil is in the details because, uh, first of all, China is a massive country and it's, uh, has a, it's, it, there's a lot of fragmentation in the market. Africa is even bigger and there is more countries and in, in each country they have their own idiosyncrasies. So looking at the big picture sometimes will, will, will make you, uh, you know, it, it will make you just negative and that's why I'm saying there's a lot of noise that is going on in the market. What is most relevant, what is most relevant to every company is what is happening in your specific sector. Because the company that is looking to export agricultural products to China is not gonna face the same situation as a company that is looking to acquire Chinese technology. You understand my point? So when yeah. we're analyzing China, Africa, we really need to start from the bottom up and not from top down. Because that will help us, first of all, weed out the noise, right? So there is a trade war between U.S. and China. But if that doesn't really affect your business, if that doesn't affect your export business, if that doesn't affect your import, then it just becomes noise. And what we are seeing, actually, is that there has been a large growth in terms of uh, more advanced uh, Chinese technology. Because as the domestic market in China becomes saturated, and as the West begins to shut off some of the entry, market entry to these firms, what else are they going to do? They have to look somewhere else for the market. And the other countries that are not in the tariff zone offer a, a perfect opportunity for that. And the countries that are outside the tariff zone and the firms are operating there, uh, you know, they're the ones who are to benefit. If the trade war is not relevant to you, Focus on your area of expertise and understand what is the situation in China for your specific industry. Because at the end of the day, China is massive, 
the industries are different, the companies in each industry are different. So, like I said, the devil is in the details, and that's the best way to analyze China-Africa relations is to start from the bottom up, not from the top down. I guess that applies to really every aspect of China-Africa relations, not just the trading side of it. So uh, sage advice. Walter Rigu is one of the smartest guys you're going to see out there on uh, on all aspects of China-Africa relations, a fluent Chinese speaker. He's lived in China for a very, very long time, uh, works extensively in Nairobi and Lusaka and throughout the African continent. And as you just heard, knows the trading relationship inside and out. Hey, Walter, if people want to follow you, I follow what you do on uh, on LinkedIn and Twitter, but what's the best way for them to find you? Uh, the best way to find me is on LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, Twitter handle is actually Kamal, C-A-M-A-L-T-D, and our LinkedIn is Kamal Group. Great. And you can also find Walter's personal page on LinkedIn. Just look for Walter Rigu, R-U-I-G-U. Walter, of course, is the managing director of China Africa Merchant Advisors Limited, Camel. Uh, you know, very, very sharp. Thank you so much for taking this time from your busy day in Nairobi. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me and all the praise. (laughs) Kobus, it's such a different experience talking to somebody who actually is a practitioner of trade rather than people like you and me (laughs) and the Twitterverse and the academic pointy heads and the analysts and the journalists who who don't really, at the end of the day, know anything about how to do business the way that this guy does. I mean, this is a guy, again, his job is to fill containers with stuff and move it across the ocean. And to get his perspective on it is so fascinating because he's able and he's trying to guide his clients to say, you know, don't pay attention to this. Meanwhile, people like you and I, and I'd say I'm more guilty of this, are oftentimes escalating the noise. And this is a guy who's saying, don't listen to that. You have to look at the details as to whether or not the US-China trade war, the currency fluctuations, any of the things that are going on right now directly impact your business. And if they don't, you know, keep going forward. So I was surprised for him to say the China-Africa trade relationship is healthy. I was surprised to learn that it's more difficult to plant soy and those import restrictions are in the stringent requirements that the Chinese have to bring in products from Africa and around the world, make it more difficult. I just assumed that it would be easy or easier to fill some of the the gaps that the Americans are leaving on the table right now. Yeah, it's, it's, it's such an interesting moment um, because I think we, you know, we, we trade-wise, we're heading more into into a more chaotic moment, I think, you know, kind of where, where a lot of, a lot of the, a lot of the, the the structures that that regulated trade and made trade quite predictable um, in the past are, are falling away or being damaged or being changed, um, and I think it, it that creates a lot of disruption. But at the same time, it also creates opportunities. But it's it's difficult to know exactly how countries, especially countries. Poor countries who who don't have a lot of money that they can that that they can throw into new infrastructure quickly, for example, or new uh, supply chain management quickly. Um, how they can can jump on those opportunities and make the most of them. Now, most African countries run massive trade deficits with China. That is, they buy a lot more from China than they sell. I think some of the exceptions to that are the oil exporting com- uh, countries, and. And again, we're in a a moment. Let's bring in the debt question here a little bit, because clearly the mood towards China has shifted in the past few months, where there is a decidedly negative view of China on the part of not just governments, but also civil society, the media. And it's not just in Africa. It's in many, many countries. It's fueled in large part, I believe, out of the United States. But, you know, there's a lot of legitimate worries and concerns about the debt issue. It just seems to me that if I was advising Xi Jinping and the Chinese government, I would say bring down some of those import restrictions, make it easier for Africans to export into China. You can defuse some of the uh, some of the pressure that you're under on the debt issue by actually opening up your markets. And ultimately, expanding trade is a much better way of empowering people than any of the 60 billion dollars that will come out of FOCAC. Because trade leads to jobs and jobs leads to sustainable economic growth. And that yeah, is, I mean, yeah, that's no, how, of I course, you know, agree. as a Japan scholar, yeah, as a Japan scholar, this part of the world that I'm in, Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore, uh, China itself, Korea, Japan, all of them built their, themselves over the past 40 or 50 years on the backs of trade. 
And I just, gosh, I just, I wish that China would make it a little bit easier for Africans to export. And, uh, you know, and to me, that would be much, much healthier. Yes, no, we'll that's I hundred percent agree. I mean, the, the 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 second part of that of that discussion is that Africa should make it much more easier to trade with itself as well. Um, you know, and and we've taken the the continent has taken a massive step forward with the, the continental free trade agreement. I mean, that that's a massive a massive improvement. But at the moment, um, intra Africa trade stands at fifteen percent of total African trade. So, I mean, that's some of the lowest in the world. All of all of these the, these regions that these countries that you mentioned. The, you know they they built on trade, but they, a lot of that trade was with each other. Um, and you know, and, and and you know, so part of part of China's yeah, growth was. Wait a minute! Wait a minute! Wait a minute! Wait a minute! A lot of that trade, particularly after World War II, from Japan, from Korea, was into the United States. And what the United States did is they gave preferential trade access to these countries in order to to build them up. And that's what I'm suggesting that China should do for a lot of its African partners is to give preferential trade access so that they can build them up. Yeah, no, you know that that's hundred percent correct. But at the same time, uh, you know, you see a lot of of things being designed in Japan, manufactured in China, sold in Korea. You know that 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 the 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 robustness of of the entire sectors trade with each other is significant. I think, um, and it makes it more stable. You know, to it 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 protects it from from the 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 whims and the changes in the the U.S. political system, for example. You know. Um, so, so Africa, Africa at the moment is, is alone in the wind, you know, because it because it doesn't have this this kind of bolstering trade that 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 maintains a kind of a minimum level of security. If Africa can get intra Africa trade up to say, you know, twenty five percent, that that already means that that African economies are that little bit more secure, you know, depending then where where they're not as vulnerable to currency fluctuations or political fluctuations in 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 different parts of the global north. So, so, so you know, the, I, I think it's. I think both are needed at the same time. So, what do you think? Do you agree with Walter that we should just shut out the noise, or are you also worried about what what fate will come for Africa, particularly the smaller countries that don't have oil to to export, or Colton, or one of the prized minerals that are particularly valuable these days. Uh, other minerals and other raw materials, commodity prices go up and they go down. And unfortunately for African countries that are becoming increasingly laden with debt, their options economically are are, are reducing quite, quite considerably. And that's what makes a lot of investors worried that we're entering into yet another emerging market crisis. Uh, for those of us who, who studied the 1997, 1998 emerging market crisis in Asia that began in Thailand, um, it it will unfold fast. And it is very, very scary how a contagion can kind of take off. And it has real effect on lots of people's lives. So all of these trade issues, the debt issues, they all come together in places like Africa. And it's something that we'll keep an eye on uh, in shows ahead. And so uh, that'll do it for this edition of the China in Africa podcast. Kobus and I will be back again next week with another show. Until then, for Kobus van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Gwobas at Stadinsky or Eric at E. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China and Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com.